Richie. Hi, Sin. Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 223 of the Snack Covenant. Wow. Hey, Richie. Yeah. Who's that with us? It is Centimeter Worm, also known as Princess Capitilla. 223 seems like a fairly auspicious number. I'm not mm. sure why, but like, maybe it's the shape, or maybe it's just the word auspicious is a word that I like to say. This is some lorical stuff, because the person on 222 said the same thing. <laughs> wow. Well, I, I, I don't know who 222 is, but that does put me in mind of like, some sort of underground facility where everybody has numbers instead of names. Oh my god, that's such a great idea! Is it? <laughs> I'm in no way advocating for a snack covenant brand underground underground penitentiary where everybody has numbers instead like of names. The Sephiroth clones are gonna have numbers tattooed on our hands or something. Yeah, so 222 was Robin, 223 is Capitiller. Do I have to be a Sephiroth clone? Because I don't. The whole one wing thing, I don't, yeah. I don't, I don't dig it. I'd like to have at least two. Well, I think like we would all be the fail Sephiroth clone, so we'd just be like a massive organs that would be absorbed into him <laughs> later on. Michele is thirty. Wow, wow, remember thirty? That was so long ago. It was. Kingdom Hearts got dark. Wow. So, Princess Capitular, tell us a little about yourself. I really like storytelling. I'm super big on basically any kind of medium that you might mention. I'm in the process of right now of reading the Earthsea books. All right. And I'm enjoying them a lot. I'm also writing a novel, which is something I've wanted to do since I was eight years old. Uh, and it's proving to be just as hard as I remember it being when I was 10. So that's fun. <laughs> I do have a YouTube channel. It's just Centimeter Worm. I also took the time tonight to dust off my Twitch channel because I'd like to start doing more streams on Twitch. It's also Centimeter Worm. I've never done a Soul Level 1 run of Dark Souls 2, and I'd like to do that. I think that would be really fun. Awesome. Thank you. Princess Capitular, you're actually here to talk about a really cool game that we haven't talked about before. I'm here to talk about probably one of my favorite games. It's called Hollow Knight. Some people on the internet may have heard of it. <laughs> mm. Yeah, little, little indie game that nobody heard of. See, like, I, I make a joke because Hollow Knight now is fucking massive and is a, a huge part of fan gamers' income. Uh, at the moment and everybody seems to and seems to know about it and like Christopher Larkin's soundtrack samples for Silk Song are getting like millions of views and like you know we live in a we live in a world where people know about Hollow Knight and it's very popular and everyone's playing it on basically every console and I am currently like every single cell in my body is is lightly on fire just scratching at the walls of my person waiting for Silk Song. Just like, when is it happening? <laughs> Team Cherry, what are you doing? Um, but for ser seriously, Cherry, if you are listening to this against all odds, <laughs> please just take your time with the game. Um, like, I can wait. And so like, when the game came out, nobody knew about it. Like, the, it had a, a reasonable number of backers on, on Kickstarter and it it met its margins and it and it shipped and I found it by watching some of my favorite streamers play it, and I was like, "Ooh, ooh what this? Some sort of new Metroid style game in a world populated entirely by bugs? Was this made for me?" <laughs> <laughs> the very first time I played it, I remember finding it on Steam and was like, "Oh, fifteen bucks! Holy shit, that's not much." So I I tried it and I was enjoying it. And there were several times I bounced off of it. It took a lot of adjusting because I first tried playing it with the keyboard and mouse and nope, nah, -uh. hmm. no, no, <laughs> oh God, Jesus Christ. No, 
it didn't work very well. And then I switched over to my my DualShock 4 and the experience was vastly improved. When I was growing up, I didn't have video games. Um, my parents were the kind of people who were like, they, they would allow us to like, you know, if they were at the gym and, you know, they brought us to the children's play area so that some sort of supervising individual could watch us, you know, they were fine with us playing Mario Kart or whatever on the N64s that they had there. But they wouldn't allow us to, to have uh, game consoles because those things rotted your brain and they were uh, a source of evil in society or whatever the fuck the... Uh, at the time that, you know, the, the, the popular thing was to say about video games. Aww. So I had a laptop when I was a teenager and I could, and I was able to use that to like play RuneScape and uh, Star Wars Battlefront and a few other things. But I didn't actually play video games seriously until I started hanging out with some people who were neighbors of ours when I was a teenager. And I finally got exposed to things like Super Smash Brothers and The Legend of Zelda and Metroid Prime, which ended up becoming like my favorite childhood game. I still have the original copy of it that I played when I was 13. Uh, it's sitting on my shelf. And Hollow Knight is just it is just Metroid Prime, like in in so many in so many ways. Uh, it was sort of like this amazing sort of through line where I start, I, I, I played this game when I was very young, I connected to it immensely. And then over time, I would go back in time a little bit and I was able to emulate Super Metroid and play that. And holy shit, this is great. I was able to emulate a little bit of the original Metroid. And then I encountered Dark Souls. Um, and like the first person who introduced me to the game pitched it to me like, oh, this is this really cool, fun game with a lot of depth and an interesting story. I was intrigued and it wasn't until I started playing it that I realized, oh, this is just Metroid Prime. This is literally just Metroid Prime. I'm finding like pathways through these uh through these areas and and this like wonderfully interconnected world and and using landmarks to navigate and that is what Hollow Knight is in a, in a in a in a nutshell as well. That being said, like it's not it 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 took it took time to get to grips with it because um I I have more experience playing like 3D games than I do 2D games. So playing Hollow Knight was like a, it, it was different. It took me a little bit of time to get to grips with how the jumping worked. I didn't know for the longest time that jump was tied to how long you hold, held down the jump button. I don't remember if that's a thing in the original Super Mario Brothers. I, I feel yeah, like it was. Yeah, it was. That was like one of the big things about like was that that jump physics control that then became standardized mm -hmm. right right yeah. uh but i never had a nes or a snes growing up so i played like zero mario the only mario games i've ever really played uh are like mario kart and mario party um so i don't know maybe that maybe that is uh what it it takes to get my nerd license revoked or something um, <laughs> had, had you played symphony of the night or any of the the post symphony Castlevanias when you played this. So Castlevania was another series that I, I never was exposed to. And I've had a lot of like when I, after I started going to college and stuff, I had a lot of people say, Hey, Castlevania is very good. Castlevania is great. And the only Castlevania game I've ever played is the first one. I emulated oh, the right. first one and played that. And I fucking loved it. Yeah. Um, it had just this wonderful, like sense of, of timing that you had yeah. to get down. It was really frustrating, but it was really like, it felt so good when you finally figured out like when to, to pull it, pull an attack. Everyone says like, you should play symphony of the night. You would really like it. And I think that that's probably true. The issue is twofold. The, the primary issue is that I, this is probably just like a personal thing, but I'm not a huge fan of the art design for Castlevania. Right. It's one of those it's one of those things where this game looks really super fun. I'm just not like driving with the aesthetic. Right. Whereas like the minute I booted up Hollow Knight and and the the main menu screen came up, I was like oh my god. <laughs> this drool like pouring out of my mouth. Um I have 
I I have a type, I guess. Um, yeah. The second the second issue is that like I'm lazy. <laughs> <laughs> I I'll own it. It's one of those things where I have to make a lot of like decisions about. Hey, Senti, um, your games that you would like to play list is now over a hundred games long, and like you haven't even touched half of the games you own on Steam. Why are you buying another game? <laughs> But yeah, like, it's it's not to say that I don't think Castlevania is good, because, like, it's an icon, you know? But yeah, I, 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 I guess that's a, a decent chunk of preamble uh, for, like, talking about the game itself, if you, if you like. Yeah, I, I can see why if you were into Metroid, but not necessarily Castlevania, this would be the go-to one because mm -hmm. that aesthetic it's all big underground catacombs and mold and shells and things mm -hmm. the world of holland is like literally made out of shells yeah rather than like i mean there there is constructed architecture there's there's buildings and things but the mm -hmm. yeah well it's also kind of due to um how the game articulates itself mechanically mm. because castlevania is more an rpg than Metroid is. Metroid is, if you have the item, you can do the thing. Whereas in Castlevania, there's lots of futzing with like what your equipment is. Yeah. It's, it is literally like what Dark Souls is. Yeah. Except in Castlevania, and correct me if I'm wrong, equipment is a little more expendable where it's like, oh, I picked up another like three swords. I guess I can yeah. just like, I, I guess I can just like bash those off at whoever the nearest vendor is. Yeah, whatever. it's all random drops. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Whereas in Dark Souls, I always got the very strong impression that, like, you pick up a sword and it's like, oh, this is this is a sword. You know, I can upgrade my sword, but, like, you know, there's only one long sword in Dark Souls. Yeah. That makes any sense. Yeah, yeah. Weapons feel a little bit more unique. Anywho. Mm -hmm. But, like, that's exactly correct. The, the design of Hollow Knight is very much, like, in the vein of, of Metroid specifically. It is all about crafting an atmosphere uh, and articulating it in the aesthetics, the art design, uh, the sound design, especially. Oh God, the sound design in the game is so good. Um, Christopher Larkin's a fucking genius. Like how the music that is unique for every area, like when you go into an area in Hollow Knight, the, the background music has like, there are certain specific like parts of the music track. So like it, it's divided into like instruments. Um, and the instruments are all playing a specific part. And as you go between certain rooms to alter the atmosphere, to, to, to sort of get a different nuance in, in each room, the, the various parts will change. Sometimes they'll get louder. Sometimes they'll get quieter. Sometimes entire like instruments will be dropped from the, from the track, depending on the room that you're in. It's, it's incredible. It's so subtle. You won't. You probably won't even notice it on your like first time playing the game, but it's insane. And like, it, sometimes this is like room to room, where it's like, how much work <laughs> did did they have to go through to like customize the sound the soundscape? And the answer is probably a lot. But if you have money, please go to Christopher Larkin's Bandcamp and give him your money. <laughs> Because <laughs> he's because he's amazing. Um, uh, Christopher Larkin is the name of the composer for uh, for the for the game. the The team cherry is, at the time of Hollow Knight's development was three people plus Chris and uh, William Pellin, Ari Gibson, and they went through like three coders. And I, I feel ashamed that I can't remember their their names, but they're still a team of three. Uh, Ari and, and William are the are the main sort of creative minds on the that that came up with the project. Mm -hmm. William did most of the coding and Ari did most of the art. So, but like it 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 genuinely is a a an experience where you feel like you're you're delving downwards into an underground world. Mm. There is I've heard speculation uh, from like other from other folks that the entirety of, of Hollow Knight, like the entirety of the world 
is all underground. Like even when you're, you're, you boot up the game and you start and you're like above ground at the starting town called Dirtmouth, you're still underground because the, the, the reasoning there being you're in this world where there are no stars. There's nothing in, there's nothing above you. There's no light above you. It's just black. And I, I, I that's an interesting interpretation. I, I don't know how much stock to put in it since the world of Hollow Knight just is fundamentally so different from our world. Um, and I think that's kind of what I wanted to talk about first is sort of like what this world is and how it works. Uh, because it's actually like, there's a lot of moving pieces. Uh, I'll, I'll try to simplify it as much as I can, but there's a lot of like metaphysical complexity to the world. I guess where I'll start is like when we first boot up the game, right? We're entreated to uh, a short musical riff where we get to read a little segment of, of a poem, basically. The poem is called Elegy for Hallownest, written by somebody named Monomon the Teacher. And um, I'm not ashamed to say that I, I do know it by heart. <laughs> uh, and it goes something to the effect of In wilds beyond, they speak your name with reverence and regret. For none could tame our savage souls, yet you the challenge met. Under palest watch, you taught, we changed. These instincts were redeemed. A world you gave to bug and beast as they had never dreamed. It's called Elegy for Hellenist. And an elegy is specifically a song that is sort of like something that you would play at like a funeral uh, so something that you would you would say is like a morning song. Mm -hmm. And it's curious to me that we would be entreated to this, like right at the start where, you know, a, a figure that we don't know yet, we haven't met them, is being praised for something, but the song is still called an elegy. I, I kind of like that as a as a hint to later developments. But the so the song itself is about a figure called the Pale King. The Pale King is probably like one of the single most important characters in the game. And the reason for this is because he is sort of responsible for all of the shit that went down. But forget about that for now. We then get to see like the, the next part of the cutscene where we are inside this sort of dark chamber and there's something like chained up in there. We get like a sort of impression of horns. And like it sort of being trapped in some kind of like a uh, web of chains. And then we like see a sort of empty space, like from this empty space where there's nothing, all of a sudden there's the, there's all of these cells. And if you look closely at them, you can see it looks like a cell. It has a cell wall and a nucleus and they're all this kind of sickly orange color. Then we zoom back out and like whatever we're looking at, kind of screams, and then we see three faces, masks, something. It's hard to say. It's hard to say what anything is at this point, but that's what we see. And then we immediately join the character that that will end, that is going to be our, our player character, um, who is currently sort of walking along a, a road of sorts, a path uh, lit by these sort of cold lamps and they've got what appears to be a, net, a weapon on their back and they look down from a cliff and there's like a path of lights leading to a little cluster of lights and it's like okay that it's this is clearly a town we got nowhere else to go so let's go this way and then the game opens with us well our character like falling into a pit and immediately i, I like how they, they they start this they immediately put you in a position where you're falling and then you land and nothing bad happens. So right off the bat, they've taught you that there's right. no falling damage in this game. Uh, so like, who is this character? Um, this character has been given like lots of names and, and like by the community and by like actual characters in the game. The name that I, that I tend to use the most is Little Ghost or just Ghost because that's sort of like the first, it's sort of like the first thing that we get called. I, I seem to recall that the first character we meet in Dirtmouth calls us 
Like you look like a ghost or something. It, it, you know, it's, it's one of those lines where it feels kind of poignant. And then later on, an entirely separate character calls us like little ghost. And it's, it's an appropriate name for a number of reasons. I mean, I, I figure like we can just kind of sort of go spoilers off at this point because like people basically know how this goes. You are the strange outsider with a mysterious past. You come to the town on top of like the hole into hell. You know, you've played Diablo, you know how this works. In this particular case, it's not necessarily that the town is built on hell, but like the the town is built on top of the 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 roads and pathways that lead down into a long lost kingdom that at one point had achieved might and power beyond imagining. It had achieved some kind of golden age. Um, all thanks to the efforts of one bug, the Pale King. And before like we go getting our, our like sort of knickers into twist on like, oh well, one person couldn't possibly have done all of that. Well, in this particular case, in this one particular case, I will I will admit, uh, the Pale King is sort of single singularly responsible for laying the foundation of the kingdom of Hallow Nest. Right. I also want to make it clear that it is Hallow Nest, not Hollow Nest. <laughs> because I hear people say Hollow Nest all the time. And it drives me insane because uh, <laughs> I, I realize there's probably like some kind of like spoonerism thing going on there where the game is Hollow Knight. Oh, this must be Hollow Nest. Mm. It's called Hallow Nest. It's like Hello, Nest. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Hello, Nest. It, that's the uh, the official greeting. You have to say that uh, whenever you meet the Pale King. <laughs> Hello, Nest. King's, and the king is like, all right. Ah, uh, yes, very good. Very good. <laughs> um, the king probably doesn't sound like that. Uh, <laughs> now I'm just imagining the Pale King sounding something like, um, oh, yes, very good. <laughs> Or something. Um, <laughs> well, you know that's that's very Castlevania. If you look at the yeah, yeah. Here's the thing, right? Uh, all of the characters in in the game are voiced. They just speak like gibberish, right? Because it's like, you know, they're they're speaking like whatever gibberish, and the game, I guess, you know, translates it to English for you, or whatever language you happen to speak and are using subtitles for. I really like this approach because it gives it it aids in giving each character uh, more personality. So like you when you hear somebody talk, like it it's just another like really strong way to characterize them. So when when Hornet is like uh, talking and she's being all dramatic and uh, and she says something like um, the rush at Kalimo, and you and you're like oh boy this lady means business. Uh, or when Zote is complaining and he's like nah meet Shadow. And you're, you're like, fucking Zoe, could you go be a bitch somewhere else, please? <laughs> Zoe is great. Like, I, I, I love Zoe. I also love to complain about Zoe. <laughs> Richie, out of all the characters in Hollow Knight, I feel like Zoe would probably be your favorite. Uh, thank you. <laughs> he, he, he has just got massive, like, cannot put up with this shit energy. <laughs> out of all the characters in Hollow Knight, Sin, I think your favorite would be Marmu. Uh, Marmu is a caterpillar, and I don't actually know Marmu's pronouns. I think Marmu uses he as as their pronouns. Um, Marmu is, looks like a puss moth caterpillar. Uh, it's if you've ever seen the caterpillar that has like the big green body and then sort of like the the white and uh, black concentric stripes around its face with little spots that look like eyes, and the two like little whippish tails with zebra stripes. That's what a puss moth caterpillar is. I just googled Marmu, and uh, it looks like it's just going ah. Yeah, yeah. Mar <laughs> Marmu is uh, is well. When we meet Marmu, he's a spirit. Uh, I'll explain more about what spirits are. But Marmu's personality is like, what if a dog could talk and loved you so much? Aww. That is literally what Marmu's personality is. And like, you you go and talk to him, and he's just like. See, Marmu doesn't have voice lines, but uh, Marmu has, like, battle cries if you choose to fight him, because you can. And Marmu's entire fight is, like, he turns himself into a beach ball and bounces at you. Aww. All of his battle cries are sound like, 
And so I imagine Marmu's voice being something along the lines of, Oh, hello, mister! <laughs> Have you come to play with me today? The queen said she would come and play with me, but she hasn't come in a very long time. Or something to that effect. Uh, Marmu is amazing, and the only meaningful interaction you can have is, like, dispelling his spirit. Uh, all of the, like, they're, the in Hollow Knight, there are these special mini-bosses you can fight called Warrior Spirits. And the only interaction you can have is to, like, fight them and release them from, like, whatever's holding them sort of stuck in the, in the mundane world. Um, spirits don't quite work like that, but the, the point is, is that, like, something is holding Marmu, like, attached to the world. So you kind of, like, do him a favor. Because it's, it's made clear that spirits don't know that they're spirits. They seem to believe that they're still, like, alive. It's just that, like, they're, they're perpetually stuck in this state of, like, clinging to wherever they died. Right. So, like, there's this one instance I remember very, very vividly where uh, some, somewhere, I think, in the Queen's Gardens, you run across two spirits that are, like, right next to each other, and they're, like, twins. And they died together. Uh, and they're constantly, like, deciding, trying to decide which way to go. But mm -hmm. one of them, like, acknowledges that they can never quite seem to decide which way to go. And they always just end up staying put. And they find that kind of strange. But they can't quite figure out why. So, like, spirits don't know that they are dead. And so Marmu doesn't understand that. And, and so, like, you know, the very first thought in your mind with this context is like, oh, I guess I'll put Marmu quote unquote, out of his misery. But Marmu doesn't seem unhappy. Marmu seems completely content to wait for the queen to come play with him for eternity. And if you do choose to, to kill, well, to quote unquote kill, it's the saddest fucking thing ever. Aww. And that, that's just Hollow Knight in a nutshell. It's like this wonderfully cute world that is filled with uh, all of these incredibly sad and dour stories. Mm. Like a lot of credit to like the the developers for being able to write very effective dialogue that just communicates this sort of like state of mind of the character. So, if I had to pick a favorite character, I I wouldn't be able to. But if you forced me to pick, <laughs> I'd probably choose Gorb. Gorb is another warrior spirit, and Gorb looks kind of like a worm, uh, with like a big head. It it. It's probably like a crest or something, but it, it looks like a brain mm -hmm. and Gorb is called the great mind. Like on, on Gorb's tombstone, like he's got a big old tombstone built for him. Um, it, it's just says Gorb, the great mind. And when you talk to him, Gorb's only dialogue is like, I am Gorb, the great mind. <laughs> Ascend, 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 ascend with Gorb. And all of all of Gorb's battle cries are sound like that. They're just like. <laughs> so let me ask you: Is Gorb short for Gorbachev? I think you cracked it, actually. Oh. Richie, thoughts? Um, I was just relieved the whole time that you weren't saying, oh, that sounds a bit like another little bug friend of the podcast. <laughs> Hi, Richie here. Sin thought some listeners might be a little confused by our reference to a little slug. Well, we just happen to have the slug with us in the studio right now. Say hello, little slug. How are you today, little slug? I cannot tell a lie. I am very happy to be here with you today. How are you, Richie? I'm doing well, I'm doing well, but I feel like trying to carry on a two-way conversation between myself and a character who frankly stretches the definition of one note might not be the best way for this podcast to proceed. Yes, I agree! So if you are interested in more of the Little Slug... Hmm. 
you can check out the episode that Sin links in the description. We now return to the podcast. So, if I had to simplify the most broadest like outline of what is actually happening. Imagine it's Saturday morning, it's like 9 a.m., you had a late night, and you just, you really need to get, you know, some Zs. And your little brother has a friend from school over, and they, like, burst into your room, and they, like, they've got flashlights. And they're, like, fighting each other with flashlights. One of them seems to be getting the upper hand until the other one, like, uh, knocks the flashlight out of his hands. And so then he goes to you and is like, help me, help me, save me. You're, you're my, you're my big sibling. Help me save me. And you then take both of the flashlights away, lock them in a cupboard higher than they can reach, and you kick them out of your room and go back to sleep. That is literally what the story of Hollow Knight is in a nutshell. Mm. <laughs> now, what do I mean by that? So, in this metaphor, there are three characters. The, the character of your little brother is the Pale King. The character that the Pale King is fighting is a being called the Radiance. And you are an entity known as the Void. So a very long time ago, the land of uh, Hallownest was not Hallownest. It was someplace else. It, as far as we know, did not have a name. And in that land, the, a being called the Radiance was sort of like a god. Kind of. Gods are weird. If you think of gods in Hollow Knight as being sort of like the great ones in Bloodborne, you're right. kind of sort of there. They're beings that have gained power uh, by ascending to di- a, a literal different plane of existence. Except it's it's not quite as fancy as all that. I'll explain uh, later. The Radiance was once like the leader of the Moth tribe, but she was able to gain so much power that she sort of ascended to a form of godhood. And her primary power was she manifested a sort of light. Mm -hmm. And in this light, it's sort of a a literal and also a metaphysical light. Beings that are exposed to it, not necessarily like being literally exposed to, you know, say a lamp, but its presence alone is sort of an exposure. And all bugs that were exposed to it sort of became unified. So imagine that, imagine like this light sort of created a a foundation, a, a hive mind that allowed bugs to sort of live in unity. The problem with this is um, all bugs sort of have a natural state of existence where they are simple minded creatures. So prior to this this force that invaded their minds and lift uplifted them to a higher level of thought they are basically just animals they would be no different than uh like regular bugs in our world the the issue is that the radiance's light unified these beings but did not necessarily like grant them higher intelligence uh and it and it and it certainly didn't grant them will of their own to do anything it's the, the hive mind like unifies, but it but it renders you kind of mindless, but uh, in a different way. You don't have any will of your own. Then what happened is a being came to the land, um, and this being was called the worm. It's theorized that there's probably more than just one. There's probably lots of like other worms that exist, but like this one. Uh, we just call it the worm because we only ever see like one in in the game, and this being, uh, and by the way, it's spelled W Y R M, capital W Y R M. Right, the the old like draconic way of writing it. Yeah, and you can almost think of this thing as. I would seriously just say like imagine a uh, like a sandworm from Dune, and you and you're good. <laughs> right, like that's kind of what it looks like. This thing battled with the radiance. Uh, presumably for dominion over the land. It wasn't able to kill the Radiance, but it was able to lock the Radiance away. I know what this is going to sound like. 
Um, it was able to lock the radiance away in a, in a, in a place called the dreamlands. Now, right. okay. So everybody who is now being like the dreamlands, well, I've played Bloodborne. <laughs> it's, it's not quite the same concept. So what are the dreamlands in Hollow Knight? It has similarities. I, um, like the, the, the fundamental concept of like this space created by the collective consciousness of beings that is also actually like a, a literal physical space. You could, you could say that it, it is those things. I think of the dreamlands in hollow Knight as a parallel dimension of potential. The dreamlands are a space where rules kind of don't exist. And everything is like the, the dreamlands in its natural state is just kind of this empty void filled with mist. Like how in, in Bloodborne, when you're in the hunter's dream and you look out over this sort of misty expanse of nothing, mm -hmm. you know, there's the faint impression at the edge of the horizon of like land that kind of looks like mountains. Uh, there's a sky. The dreamlands doesn't even have that. It is just... It is just emptiness filled with kind of like a, a dull, sourceless light um, that pervades everything. Right. And things can be conjured into and out of existence in the dreamlands. And there is a, a connection that exists between the waking world and the dreamlands that usually manifests in terms of like people's emotions and memories. Specifically, memories have a strong connection to the dreamlands and like an impression or, or a strong emotion that is tied to those memories. So like you can find like chunks of pieces of buildings and stuff that are kind of floating. It's one of those weird things where it's like, this is a space where certain rules don't apply. Like gravity doesn't really exist, but you can still fall. Right. Because this is going to sound really like crazy, but my own sort of interpretation is you as an, as a being that dwells in the mundane world are so used to the force of gravity that you just can't imagine being in a space where gravity doesn't exist. So you just go whichever way is down. Right. So like, even though other things that aren't like living things just kind of float around. Um, the first time you actually enter the dreamlands, you're, you're trapped there by three other characters who I will get to. And you sort of awaken on what fe what looks like a, just a chunk of cobblestone road. And as you kind of like move towards the edge, stones and, and other like sort of chunks of road and pathways will just form out of nothing. Right. I, I, I have a vivid memory of wandering through what feels like a pavilion um, made out of like columns and it's like ah oh, this architecture feels familiar it feels like i've seen this before but i can't quite place it right and all of the dreamlands is kind of like this every single like part of the dreamlands is conjured into existence by some kind of strong desire or memory associated with like a a an impression or um, and that's kind of what the spirits are in my interpretation. The, the spirits that you encounter in the real world, they're not actually like souls, but they are like a, a, an impression that was so strong that it left a, like a lingering dream. Right. Um, sort of in the real world. Can you tell me how exactly are dreamlands made in Hollow Knight? Well, the dreamlands themselves exist apart from the world. In Lovecraft, if I if I understand it correctly, because it's been a while since I've read the dream start, the dream cycle, the dreamlands in Lovecraft are conjured into existence from the collective like unconscious. Um, They're shaped uh, by it. Shaped by it. Yeah. Okay. I don't remember if they're ever given an actual point of origin. That seems like a, a thing Lovecraft would. Do yeah. Honestly. Yeah. Yeah. I would say the dreamlands are a separate sort of dimension they exist it exists parallel to the mundane world but apart from it and it's its own space like it's not something that was conjured into existence by by 
like the by uh, the existence of consciousness itself, because the the vast majority of, of bugs prior to the emergence of beings like the radiance or the worm, they don't possess consciousness. Um, in order to achieve consciousness in this world, bugs have to be given it. They have to be like like they they have to surround some kind of force or figure that is able to uplift them somehow. It's not made explicit whether or not this is like a temporary thing or if it's like you need you need to kickstart it and then like from that point on bugs can keep sort of like sustaining consciousness or if it over time fades away and they kind of go back to that state of being like mindless animals. Right. It's never made explicit yeah. whether or not like that's the case. Yeah. Well, that's, that's very like demon Soulsy. Like we've talked about that with um, specifically with, with Loki, but also with other people, the idea of like demon souls specifically, not necessarily dark souls, but it positions like the soul as rationality. Mm -hmm. Your reason and your rationality is your soul. So when that's gone, you said sort of it's literally what separates people from animals. Mm -hmm. it's that. And then they they continue that through Bloodborne, where like the the notion of like beasthood isn't necessarily physically I'm a different species. It's that my my human reason is gone. I've begun to right. seek something. Yeah, I'm I'm driven by baser instincts now. Hollow Knight yeah. does have a a lot of that kind of going on under the hood, where the question is asked like what actually you know separates us from from a, a more beastly existence right what is the what is the rational mind and hollow knight makes some metaphors about it i'll try to see if i can explain them when we get to it but mm. since you bring up the soul uh this is a good segue for me to talk about soul so in Hollow Knight, there are a number of metaphysical substances, and one of them is soul. Almost all beings in the world of Hollow Knight possess soul. I would describe it as a, uh, a substance neither liquid nor gas. It is a substance that can coagulate into a, a, a sort of liquid form. So are you saying the soul has neither heft nor a lift? It's as thin as air. I feel like I'm being referenced at, but I don't want to seem like I'm an idiot that doesn't get the reference. Richie, thoughts? I, I also feel like I'm being referenced at. <laughs> uh, we could probably put in a footnote there. Oh, we can put in uh, Rich's notes. <laughs> oh my God, I love Richie's notes so much. I I learned about I learned about uh, friggin' um, beef Bovril, beef. yeah. Bovril. Oh my God. It's I can't say anything because like I I buy chicken stock and just heat it up and drink chicken stock. <laughs> so like I have no legs to stand on. <laughs> Hi, Richie here. Sin's description of water as having neither heft nor lift is taken from the video game Legacy of Cain Soul Reaver, which I haven't played since I was 15, hence my mystified silence. The full quote is, Water in the spectral realm has neither heft nor lift. It's as thin as air. This is why the main character can't swim. If this sounds fascinating to you, check the description for more great Legacy of Kane content. Back to the podcast. Soul is something inside of all living things. And the way that this is represented in game is when you hit an enemy with a with a melee attack with your, your main weapon, which is called the nail, you gain soul. Uh, and soul is the main resource that you use to do a lot of stuff. So like you strike an enemy and you have a little sort of circular vessel uh, on the screen that starts to fill up. Um, and at certain breakpoints, it will like go from a, a sort of dim gray color to like a, a sort of soft white color. 
And that's represented on your character by having a little puff of sort of white gas kind of escape the character. And the, the substance that fills the vessel is clearly a liquid. Like it, it, it behaves in the same way that like water does. Cause it has, it has sort of like a flowing pattern that's animated in. Um, and it also makes like the li little like goopy, it does a little goopy thing that when you shake like a water bottle and little like globlets of water kind of fly all over the place, it does that. And you use soul to heal. Uh, so like if you get hit, by an enemy and you take damage you can focus soul and you can repair it and it consumes soul so it's like soul is the source of life it's described as being like the source of life kind of like how the soul is described in in dark souls but the the concept is a little bit more literalized and souls in dark souls kind of have this sort of immaterial feel to them where it's like you can you'll you never like reach well you can reach an upper cap on how many souls you can hold but that's more like a a gameplay thing that the game can't remember beyond a certain number rather than like we are arbitrarily setting the a cap on how many souls you can hold whereas in Hollow Knight there is a there is like a not arbitrary cap uh this is for gameplay reasons but once you've filled up this vessel with soul you can't collect anymore. So hitting enemies doesn't like doesn't give you anymore. This is sort of at, in a gameplay sense. This is meant to like incentivize the player to constantly be using soul because if you're if you're full on soul, then you can't gain it. And if you like, and if you get you know hit and you don't heal, it's inefficient use of resources. Right at the start of the game. When, you're, when your soul vessel is full, you have three uses. So you can take three damage and you can heal. Uh, you can also get like magical spells that consume soul. Uh, the first one you get is called the Vengeful Spirit, which it's just like a big laser beam fires out a great big blob of, of soul that barbecues anything in its path. That's not like a, a, a silly thing that I said. Uh, it literally cooks them because the it applies like a... Uh, uh, a texture to the bodies where they look burnt and they're smoking. It's pretty. It's pretty metal. Yes. <laughs> but like the the soul soul is used to do all of these things. But it's all so it's simultaneously an offensive resource and a and a resource you need to heal. Um, but you can only hold so much of it at, at a time. So the game is encouraging you to like, okay, if you take damage and you have the soul to heal, then you should because you can always get more soul by hitting enemies and. Um, the game does a, an, an interesting thing where some enemies will respawn uh, when you go like into a different room and come back, but some enemies don't. Uh, you have to rest at like a checkpoint for them to respawn. I think Castlevania does something similar, where like some enemies respawn if you go into a different room, but some yeah. don't. Yeah. So you can actually like you can just kind of go back and forth between rooms to farm enemies for soul. Uh, if you want to, uh, it's it's like a completely valid way to to restock on on masks if you're if you're suffering in a particularly like challenging platforming section. So um, we don't really actually know what soul is, and we kind of have to sort of take it like we have to take it for granted that soul is what the game tells us it is. It's sort of the source of life. It's what makes things alive. One character. Uh, called the hunter. <sighs> Again, I hear you, Bloodborne people creeping in. I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna kick you out. I'm gonna kick you right out. Uh, the the hunter is like this big, like this this massive, uh, uh, like skeletal looking thing that hides in a bush uh, until you until you finish his diary for him. No, I'm not making this shit up. <laughs> the hunter, when you first meet him, gives you his diary, and he's like. If you can unlock the secrets of my diary, I will give you a present. And the present is is his apparently his like undying respect or something. So oh. he's he's like the biggest weeb in the game. <laughs> the hunter, his entire like he the character exists entirely as a as a cutesy way to put a bestiary in the game and have it be like a part of the world. 
Right. Hollow Knight is so good at incorporating game mechanics as like actual elements of the world. So like the Hunter's Diary, the idea is that it's written in a different language, but as you kill enemies, you will begin to understand the language. And what this means mechanically is kill 10 <laughs> Gruzzer flies to, to unlock the, the Hunter's notes about the Gruzzer fly. Right. But in somewhere buried in there, I, I recall the hunter talking about how, you know, when he's going around and, and murdering things to eat them, things taste better the fresher they are. And he speculates, of, uh, is this because it still, it, like, it still has the most soul inside it? Right. It's worth noting that, like, soul is not something that all bugs can use. Like, our character is somewhat unique in that very few beings can actually use soul to do things. There's one particular area in the game where you encounter uh, this sort of cult of bugs who have been harvesting soul to use it in experiments uh, of like trying to figure out how to like expand the mind and like, okay, all you, all you folks that are creeping in that are all like, oh, Bloodborne. Like, this one I'll give to you. The Soul Sanctum is very Bloodborne. It's like a big gothic, like, laboratory, and there's an organ playing the entire time you're there. It's <laughs> literally almost the research hall. And in one particular point after you fight uh, the boss of the area called the Soul Master, there is a massive room that is piled just all the way to the ceiling with corpses. Like, the room itself looks like it's made out of corpses. So, like, fair play, this feels as though it took a little yeah. bit of inspiration from Bloodborne. The organ they're playing, is it an umbilical cord? We never actually get to see the organ. We'll add a little... <laughs> oh, I forgot. There. You're right, wait. There we go. <laughs> Sin, would you say... Would you say the secret to comedy is timing? <laughs> no, Richie, the secret to comedy is is you just tell the same <laughs> awful joke again and again and again, and eventually they're forced to laugh. <laughs> That's how comedy actually works. Thank you, Capitiller. Thank you, Richie. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, but, okay, so... Soul, again, is one of those weird things where it seems that if you're a normal bug, in order to use soul, you have to, like, study and you have to train yourself. Whereas, for whatever reason, our character, Ghost, is able to, like, from the start, uh, Ghost can focus soul and repair their shell. Also, uh, just to get this out of the way, Ghost's, ghosts pronouns are they and them. Uh, it is It is literally canonical that what what ghost is is not a a is not a gendered being right uh i'll talk about the vessels uh later but all you really need to know about them for now is the vessels are not gendered they have they are beings with no gender oh so you're saying they took inspiration from a bruitus does a bruitus not have gender because i always heard oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> i've always heard you guys use he and him to refer to a brutus it's complicated, but it's just <laughs> we just. It's as if the character isn't terribly well thought through. It's just we use it uh, in order for you know our feeble human minds to understand. Yeah, uh, Richie, it's like it, we we can't we cannot comprehend the 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 weird divinity of this of this eldritch creature. Yeah, the thing is, okay, like Ibruitus, the main one, the blue one. Um, Ibruitus <laughs> does not have gender. <laughs> However, <laughs> like. We have to make sure that we're very clear about which Abruitus we're talking yeah. about. <laughs> yeah. However, there are some Abruitai that have genders. Like, Bell Bruitus uh, yes, uses female yes. pronouns. Who is also your sister somehow. <laughs> I'm so happy you used the correct the correct uh, pluralization for the Latin. I'm, that made me very happy. So <laughs> Thank you. Congrats. <laughs> uh, we're still trying to figure out whether Sir Bruitus is a separate being or if it's just a Bruitus dressed in like a little top hat with a monocle. Who's who's we? <laughs> who's this we, Kimosabe? <laughs> um. um okay, well 
Uh, now my head is just filled with like this this image of um, a Brutus. Like it's like it's like a scene from a Polly Pocket like straight direct to video animation. Yeah. Uh, where where like the girls go to the go shopping and they go to the changing rooms and it's that like montage of changing room curtains closed, changing room curtains open, and you know they're wearing a new outfit mm. and but it's. It's a Brutus, and each time the curtains close, a Brutus yeah. is wearing a new outfit, but they can barely fit in the changing room because, like, <laughs> so massive. So, like, just nobody understands. Out under the door. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, but nobody understands how they're able to do this, and everyone's just slightly uncomfortable. And like, <laughs> but nobody wants to. But nobody wants to like question it. It's like, and then and then like, a Brutus like slimes over to the the, the counter is like, hello, yes, I would like to first speak one. <laughs> These ones seem uh, the most emotionally <laughs> And the and the the poor cashier is just like Would you like to join our frequent buyers program today, sir? <laughs> um and a bird is just like, oh no thanks, I don't get out too much. <laughs> All right, so we're actually going to call it there because we got a little distracted discussing Hollow Knight and various things because there's a lot to discuss and we're kind of out of time. So we are going to get Senti Worm back another point to discuss the rest of Hollow Knight. Yay! And hopefully he won't get distracted. (laughs) Princess Capertiller, could you please tell us again where people can find you on social media and such? Um, I have a Twitter account. It's just at Centimeter Worm. I almost never go on there because Twitter is scary. I can be found on YouTube, which is just Centimeter Worm. I also am dusting off my Twitch account. Uh, again, Centimeter Worm, because I want to do some, like, Dark Souls 2, Soul Level 1 streams uh, at some point. And um, I feel like I would have more success with that on Twitch than I would on YouTube. Uh, that's about it. Awesome! Well, thank you so much for coming by. We learned a lot about Hollow Knight. I hope it was d- digestible. <laughs> I, I, I feel like it may have been a bit chewy, so you may you may want to cut it up real small. <laughs> chewy? <laughs> oh! <laughs> yeah! <laughs> oh god! Did I, did I say something bad? Did I do a bad? No! Listen, listen, I just invented a new character. No, you didn't. <laughs> They're like covered entirely in hair, and they live in a universe called Star Wars. Do they go, oh yes, I'll have a sport of tea. Exactly. <laughs> it's so amazing to, to, to listen to the original cuts of yeah. A New Hope without like any of the sound added in post because the actor for Chewbacca has this like thick English accent. Yeah. Whenever he's talk like whenever they're like, say your line. Like the the one I vividly remember is they're in the the sort of like side room where they're planning to, to go to the detention block. And the the line that the actor says is I don't know, man's mad. <laughs> because referring to Ben when Ben goes off to yeah. turn off the, the tractor beam thing. Yeah. And it's just like, I would prefer this, actually. <laughs> I kind of like this better than... Like, the, 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 the weird bear noises have their own charm, but just yeah. this big, woolly, Bigfoot-type character with a posh British accent is just... Mwah, <laughs> beautiful. Shabskis. 